This is Twit. Steve, what did I do last summer? Because I don't remember. <laughs> it's all a blur. I don't think any of us, I think a lot of us did very little this last <laughs> yeah, summer. Yeah, that's right. Um, there are two pieces of research, one conducted eight years ago in 2012, and a similar, very closely related research, which was presented just last month during the USENIC's 16th Symposium on Usable Privacy and Security. The earlier paper from 2012 was titled, uh, interestingly, Why Johnny Can't Browse in Peace. <laughs> Okay. Okay. On the on the uniqueness of web browsing history patterns, uh, it explains its purpose and its findings as follows. They wrote, "We present the results of the first large scale study of the uniqueness of web browsing histories, gathered from a total of a lot, three hundred and sixty eight." 1,284 internet users who visited a history detection demonstration website. Um, and remember, we've previously talked about how this can be done. Um, since our browsers will color previously visited URL links differently from ones that it has not seen before, it's possible for a sneaky website and server to remotely probe our browser's site visiting history by placing test URLs into the DOM, the document, ob the document object module, uh, model, sorry, document object model, and then using the Canvas API to read out the rendered color of those links. Again, <laughs> not anything any of the designers of these APIs ever intended to have happen. But as we keep seeing, where there's a will, there's a way. And the more sophisticated and complex we make our browsers, the more, you know, they they become little like touring complete systems that can do all kinds of unexpected and unintended things. Anyway, in their abstract, they wrote, our results show that for a major so, okay, so just backing up, 368,000 plus internet users visited this history detection demo website, which sucked essentially and effectively sucked the browsing history out of their web browser, which is not supposed to be available to sites you visit, right? That's none of their business, but again, can be done. They said, our results show that for a majority of users, 69%, the browsing history is unique and that users for whom we could detect at least four visited websites were uniquely identified by their histories in 97% of cases. Okay, in other words, where we steer our browsers is surprisingly unique. And, you know, I know my own browser use. Yeah, I'm, I go to a few sites that, you know, like like DigiKey and DigiCert that, you know, lots of other people are not going to be going to directly. So I can see that. They said, we observe a significant rate of stability in browser history fingerprints for repeat visitors. 38% of fingerprints are identical over time and differing ones were correlated with original history content indicating static browsing preferences. We report a striking result that it is enough to test for a small number of pages in order to both enumerate users' interests and perform an efficient and unique behavioral fingerprint. We show that testing 50 web pages is enough to fingerprint 42% of users in our database, increasing to 70% with 500 web page tests. Finally, we show that indirect history data, such as information about categories of visited websites, 
can also be effective in fingerprinting users. And that's so, sort of like taking a meta uh, view of websites, classifying similar websites, and then using that as the fingerprint. That's also effective to fingerprint users. And that similar fingerprinting can be performed by common script providers. Again, similar fingerprinting can be performed by common script providers such as Google or Facebook. Hmm. Okay, so in other words, uh huh, uh huh. Hmm. It's not just cookies and it's not just, you know, obvious things. In other words, this introduces another entire category of tracking signal and or tracking reacquisition in the event of third party cookie blocking or deliberate cookie deletion. Our browser histories turn out to serve as a surprisingly powerful disambiguator. That makes sense. Yep. And as I, yeah, it does make sense. And as I mentioned, that research was followed up on and recently updated by a three person team at Mozilla. Their Usenix paper from a couple weeks ago was titled Replication Why We Still Can't Browse in Peace on the uniqueness and re-identifiability of web browser histories. And they explained their work and their findings uh, a little more briefly as follows. They said, we examined the threat to individuals' privacy based on the feasibility of re-identifying users through distinctive profiles of their browsing history visible to websites and third parties. Again, that's the key visible to websites and third parties. They said this work replicates and extends the 2012 paper, Why Johnny Can't Browse in Peace, on the uniqueness of web browsing history patterns. The original work demonstrated that browsing profiles are highly distinctive and stable. We reproduce those results and extend the original work to detail the privacy risk posed by the aggregation of browsing histories. Our data set consists of two weeks of browsing data from about 52,000 Firefox user volunteers. Our work replicates the original paper's core findings by identifying 48,919 now, remember, out of 52,000, 48,000, almost 49,000, not 48,919, distinct browsing profiles, of which 99% are unique. High uniqueness holds even when histories are truncated to just 100 top sites. Wow. We then, uh huh. This is really not surprising, we then find, really. Yeah, yeah I, I agree, Leo. I mean, what's surprising is it, that they like, can read it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's that's what's annoying. <laughs> uh huh. Exactly. Of course, if you have it, we, you could make it. It's probably very unique. Yep. 100%. We then find yeah. that for users who visited 50 or more distinct domains in the two week data collection period, about 50% can be re identified using the top 10,000 sites. Re identifiability rose to over 80% for users that browsed 150 or more distinct domains. Finally, we observe numerous, uh, so basically what, what that's saying is that if, if, if in a short period of time, not many total domains were visited, that is some people just didn't ro roam broadly, then there just isn't enough. Right. Uh, virtual yeah. uniqueness, yes, right. in order to identify them. But if if, if that's if, if a person tends to roam around a lot more, to for example visit 150 different distinct domains, then they become much more 80 percent re-identifiable. Right. And they said, finally, we observe numerous third parties pervasive enough to gather web histories sufficient to leverage browsing history as an identifier. Um, 
Uh, we knew that, you know, so remember word. when we talked about how Google was doing the work of God by taking uh, third-party tracking cookies out of Chrome finally? Uh-huh. But we, we surmised at that time, that's only because they have a better way of fingerprinting you. And, yep. and they don't want the amateurs doing it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Let us fingerprint users. And, of course, and this so, proves oh, it. So, yes. So, exactly. The, oh, the overt privacy problem of cookies that everyone looks at turns out to be like, eh, okay, fine, block them. We don't care. And you'll notice that DNT didn't go anywhere because it didn't specify how you track, just please don't. And so it's like, ah, no, we don't really want to do that. We don't want people to, we don't want to have to honor someone saying don't track me because We'll we'll just say, oh, hey, wouldn't wouldn't you like those cookies removed? Yeah, we'll 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 ha we'll scrape those off for you. So uh, it is discouraging. There are two ways that our histories can be obtained. They can be obtained by sucking them out of our browser, for which the technology exists. All of these different entities. Oh, Leo, uh, I've discovered a creepy site called DoubleVerify.com. If you go to doubleverify.com and just sort of – this is one of the people, okay. one of those that we sometimes see. They, they tend to stay in the shadows. They don't like to be seen. But I, I picked up on them when I was doing this research about what sites are there doing this behind our backs. It is a super slick-looking site, and it's, but it's a little bit creepy when you, know, you sort of understand that, that these are the people who are who – are, putting little script snippets in ads and on websites. But they're, but they're in the business of trust, Steve. Oh, oh, I, I missed that, Leo. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see where it said that. <laughs> how could they uh -huh. be? How could they be bad? How could they be bad? Oh. By the way, this stupid accept cookies pop up, of course. Now we know. <laughs> That's meaningless. <laughs> yeah, sure. Whatevs. Go ahead. Put cookies yeah, on that'll, there. That'll, that'll, that'll keep stop them, them pacified. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of this uh, in the world. They call these tracking pixels. And uh, there's all sorts of ways to do this, even though, in fact, a lot of them are not pixels anymore. It's just kind of that's how they used to do it. Right. They drop little bits of script now. Yeah. And they're able to do much, much more, more by. Yeah. yeah. It's very much like the Google Analytics that, you know, it's so useful for the website because Google tells you all kinds of cool stuff. But it's also Google running their own script on every single one of those pages out in the world. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. 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 So that and an ISP monitoring our DNS queries. That's the other way you obtain browser histories is by looking at the DNS lookups that all of your clients are using. And so uh, another sort of little nudge toward uh, using uh, encrypted DNS in the future, which looks like it's, you know, it's where we're all headed. So anyway, I thought that was really, really interesting. I just wanted to put it on all of our listeners' radar that, uh, yes, uh, maybe it's worth flushing our browser histories. It's it's sad, too, because I really like the fact that my links are, you know, that like when, when I do a search for something that is like related to something I've searched for before, I see some that are, you know, purple, and I go, oh, I've, you know, I've already been in there. No need to go again. And, and oh, Google's a little spooky because it'll say, oh, you were there three days ago. It's like, okay, yeah, well, I am being, <laughs> I'm being tracked. Well, you know, I also I know. I'm a little it's free. sympathetic. Everything's free, Leo. Yeah, it's I'm a little free, sympathetic. So. We do some a little bit of that ourselves. Um, if I, you know, to be in full disclosure. Because podcasts, you really can't do <laughs> tracking pixels, as you might imagine. But that's one. Remember, we were talking earlier about redirects. One of the redirects uh, goes through a company uh, called, I can't remember the name. I'll say Chartbeat. I can't remember. But it goes through a company that does an interesting thing. And I think this is the, our advertisers say, you've got to do something. So we don't do it for everybody. They have to pay for it. We don't. They don't get any information, which is the good news. But what happens is... Uh, this company gets uh, our uh, get, uh, gets our effectively 
our logs. They get the redirects through them. So they track yep. the IP addresses. They store those of all the downloads. But they don't give them to anybody. We're very careful to make sure this is not uh, public information. Uh, it's the same stuff that we've been using. We send to PodTrack, the same exact stuff. And then they, if a company wants to contract with them for an ad campaign, let's say LastPass says, we want to see if this drove any traffic. Of course, we always use those URLs, but and we hope people will use them. But they're not, companies want to say, well, we don't know if we trust them. Most companies, uh, most of the uh, URLs tend to be Twit, even though, like, if I have a security now, people are still going to use Twit instead as the offer right. code. So right. everybody says, well, Twit works, even if they've never been on Twit. Um, they say, well, that's the one that works the best because everybody uses that. So you, you lose some credit. So what these, what we'll, a company, if they want to do more informational tracking, will then put the tracking pixel from this company, uh, Chartable, I think, on their site. And then that redirects IP addresses of people visiting their site or their landing page to Chartable. And Chartable does a matchup. And without, uh, right. without sending IP address information to the advertiser... Or disclosing right. it, they say 82% of the people that visited your site in this three-week period also, also downloaded Security Now. Nice. So I consider that a relatively benign. We have to do something because advertisers are really, nowadays, I mean, look, we're competing against Facebook and Google who tell them everything, right? They know everything about you. Uh, we know nothing about you except for the fact that you downloaded that show. So I think this is a relatively benign way without disclosing any information about you to any third party. Uh, matching those IP addresses up gives them some knowledge about how successful their campaign was. And they, at this point, well, and, almost and have also to do that. bouncing through multiple redirects tends to be an anonymizing thing anyway. Right. I mean, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, we, 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 act, we bounce it through, I think, two redirects right now. One is uh, our own for counting. Because we, we we're trying to we charge people based on how many people listened, so we need to count that. That's a cost per thousand is how we work, and then we do this additional uh, charitable redirect so that people can. Uh, I think it's charitable. I hope I'm not saying the wrong name. We 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 looked. We went through three different companies to find one that really was, was privacy forward and would would do this respectably, and we think we found one. And I can't remember who it was, but gosh, I'm probably saying the wrong name. Anyway, this company matches it up without giving up any information of yours to anybody else. And I think that's benign, right? Yeah. Does it I sound think like that's as benign as it could be? Uh, yeah. Yep. I don't, we don't, re, we don't, the beauty of RSS, the reason Spotify's buying podcasts is because then you listen in their app. That's why they make them exclusive and they know everything about you. We don't know anything about you. We just know you downloaded the show. And all we know is the IP address you used when you downloaded it. That's it. And frankly, that's all we'd ever want to know. I don't even want to know that much, but it's inevitable. That's how you count. Ad you can't, you have to count unique IP addresses or you wouldn't know the downloads, right? Because very frequently, for instance, uh, you use Apple's podcast client. It'll open 10 straight. It'll download 10 different parts of the podcast at once. So, but is that 10 downloads? No, that's one. And so you yep. can't just count hits. So anyway, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, I want it in full disclosure. We do something like that, yeah. but I think we do it in a way that's as benign as possible. Anyway, and if you hate that, then uh, use VPN, ExpressVPN. <laughs> no one will know. <laughs> no one will know. It's completely up to you.